Cairo, Seattle. I'm Rachel Bell, and this is Your Last Meal, a show about famous people and the stories behind the foods they love most. Today on the program, writer and activist Lindy West. Lindy is a contributing opinion writer for The New York Times. She's the author of the truly fantastic book, Shrill, Notes from a Loud Woman, and she's a proud feminist who co-founded the Shout Your Abortion movement. She's also very hilarious, and she chose a very hard-to-pronounce Norwegian pastry for part of her last meal, which we try and pronounce before the interview started. More cocker. That was, I think that was good. Really? Wait, let's listen to it one more time. Okay. Before I say it on the air. Smurkake. Smurkake. That's really good. You have to be real slow. What, what, what was the Danish one again? It was just like smorka. Smorka and Mindy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Danish is weird, according to my mother. Yeah, my mom's always like, yeah, Danish is like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> oh, good burn, mom. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Lindy and I also talk about what it's like eating in public when you're a fat person. Fat being the straightforward word that she prefers to use to describe her body. And she pushes the boundaries of your last meal by regaling us with a fantastic six course feast, which has never been done before, I don't believe, on this program. And one of those courses leads us to Larson's Bakery in Seattle's North Ballard neighborhood, where a Danish baker named Paul Larson claims to be the only bakery in the country selling a buttery almondy pastry called, let's let's try it here, smurkaka, a pastry he gave me a slice of at the very start of our interview. I shouldn't have eaten because I'm supposed to talk to you about... <laughs> and we'll talk about the cozy Scandinavian craze that has invaded the United States over the past couple years called huga. You may have seen this in writing. It's H-Y-G-G-E. Huge. Very good, Aaron Mason. Thank you. We will talk about Hugue with two people, Mike Viking, who is the author of The Little Book of Hugue, and Signa Johansson, author of How to Hugue, The Nordic Secrets to a Happy Life. But first, the easy to pronounce, Lindy West. You recently went to the Oscars. I did. Okay, first of all, what's what's the food like? Do they give you dinner? And second, I feel like the cool thing to do that you see on social media or in, in the magazines is the stars going like, I'm not going to that party. Instead, my husband and I went to In-N-Out. Uh, what was your food experience like? We did hear <laughs> it was, um, I'll tell you the whole story in a second, but the after party that we went to was catered by Wolfgang Puck. And I did hear, we did hear a guy walking out with his friend going, I'd rather have In-N-Out than Wolfgang suck. <laughs> <laughs> There's a good burn. So, yeah. Um, which was incorrect because the food created by Wolfgang Puck was incredible. But... Uh, okay, so first of all, you go to the Oscars. They have like hors d'oeuvres and champagne beforehand, except we did not get there in time. So there was just like some bags of popcorn and chips, potato chips, plain. So we didn't. I didn't have any. There was a little snack box under the seat. Under everyone's seat, there was a little lunch box filled with snacks. Very Oprah-esque under the seat. I know. Yeah. Um, and the, the snacks were strange. There was more uh unflavored potato chips in a bag some chocolate covered oreos two each i forget everything else some gummy bears i think so we're like okay so this is the oscar food fine i appreciate a couple a little snack because <laughs> yeah. it is very long it did felt like we were like kids on a field trip like it was like all right here don't get fussy here okay so then afterwards we had tickets to the governor's ball which is the like big official party that's a, like in the same building as the ceremony and that's what was catered by Wolfgang Suck which was truly <laughs> incredible it was like the buffet stretched around like three sides of this massive wow. ballroom and it was like there was like about you know a mile of desserts that were like tiny chocolate Oscar men airbrushed gold by Wolfgang himself. Like, it was crazy. And there was a whole thing that was like a pile of lobsters and you wow. could just go grab them. So if you're calling him Wolfgang, does it become Wolfgang socks? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, it's Checking. probably Wolf Wolfgang also. I don't Wolfgang know. socks? I'm not a, I don't know. But I had all this like makeup on and I was wearing like a light pink dress and so I actually didn't really eat that much of the food but my husband did and he said it was amazing like I was like 
I was like, I just feel like I can't just be like slamming lobsters. I'm going to destroy this dress, which I hope to return. <laughs> so no lobster bib, I'm guessing. No lobster bib. <laughs> you yourself like to use the word fat. And yes. you are. I love it. You love it. Yeah. <laughs> it's your favorite. Um, and people define you as leading the fat acceptance movement. So can you talk about what it's like? I mean, even just to come on a podcast like this, like you've had problems with trolls in the past and you've since quit Twitter, which I imagine has um, taken down your troll count and you don't write for Jezebel anymore. So you don't have like all of these people leaving comments like you used to. But what is it like to go on a food show or just to eat in public as somebody who identifies as fat? Oh, it's I mean, I I assume, I don't know what it's like to be a thin person going on a food podcast, but um, it's a different experience for sure. I mean, I there's a lot of pressure to present yourself as the as like a good kind of fat person, the kind of fat person who's trying to be thin, who's eating six almonds for breakfast um, and not eating, uh, for example, what I actually had for breakfast today, uh, which was only by necessity and by accident. But I was like, you know, sometimes when you do a radio thing, they have you say what you had for breakfast yes. to get your levels. And yeah. I was like, should I lie or should I tell the truth? Um, the truth is, the lie that I was going to say was that I had nothing for breakfast. The truth is, I was late, so I ran out the door. And then halfway here, I started to, like, get panicked with hunger. I was like, oh, God, what am I going to do? I don't have time to go to the store. What am I going to do? And then I remembered that in the, <laughs> the glove compartment was a Twix yes. that... Um, my husband bought on the ferry yesterday and then did not get eaten. So then I had half of a Twix. So was half mean one of the bars? Great question. I was like, I will have to explain that I had half of a half of a Twix. I had a quarter of a Twix. Okay. I had half of a right Twix <laughs> for my breakfast. The right one is way more filling than the left. I think you made a good choice. Yeah. Oh, so anyway, you weigh questions like that. Like, should I tell this ridiculous story about eating half a Twix for breakfast? Because now that I did tell it to you into the microphone. If anyone who hates me and thinks I'm disgusting is listening, they'll be like, see, I knew she eats a candy bar for breakfast every day. Right. Because people also don't believe you if you're like, I had salad. Like, there's no winning. If you're like, yeah, I had a, I had 18 cookies. They're like, duh. And if you're <laughs> like, I had a bowl of fruit. They're like, no, you didn't. <laughs> so basically, I mean, I don't really actually engage in any of that, but there's still that lingering anxiety of like, oh, what's... How is this going to be used against me? Well, yeah, you've established you've come to a place where you have a healthy relationship with yourself and with food. It seems like from what I've read in your books and your articles yeah. and stuff. But like, did you or do you ever have an experience like where you order something that you don't really want when you eat in public because you feel like you have to eat something healthy? Oh, totally. I was like spending eight dollars on cantaloupe. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, because you're you want to have pancakes, but it's like. You can't just have pancakes. Yeah. I need to have some virtuous honeydew chunks. And they're I, never good. They're, they're always good. underripe. And they're so expensive. Also, I feel like restaurant fruit servings are really doing the honeydew a disservice because yes. a good honeydew is incredible and you never get one at a restaurant in a fruit cup. Literally never. <laughs> Literally never. The cantaloupe are always white yeah. and pale. Like, this is not a good way to showcase cantaloupe. No, and I feel like many of our nation's children are growing up thinking that melons are disgusting. I think you're right. And it's simply not true. Because people tell me a lot, actually, that they don't like cantaloupe. Yeah. A lot. <laughs> People are running up to you on the street. Yeah. They have to let you know. It's true. And you've also had experiences when you go out to eat with your husband, who you describe as, what do you describe, like traditionally? I don't know, it's normal. Normal. <laughs> well, no, I guess normal is a kind of a loaded word. We don't like to use the word he's, normal. He's tall and average yeah. size. And people have given you separate checks because they don't think that you're a couple. Oh, n like once a week. Really? Yeah. Wow. I know it's really weird. I mean, and may, you know, you you can't necessarily attribute it every time to people assuming that we're not married. Sometimes they just want to err on the side of separate checks in case. I don't know. I feel like they never want to separate the check, though. They always want everybody I to have know. one check. I know. So that's weird, right? No. We're literally holding hands. <laughs> what are you talking about? Come, I, But I, I think there's just this, such an expectation uh, for people to match. I mean, there are a whole threads on message boards devoted to why my husband doesn't have a hotter wife because he could he could definitely get one so why is he why would he be with me you know someday you'll grow up and discover that when you marry someone you should marry someone that you want to spend all your time with yeah. and that you like 
So get a little more sapiosexual. Sometimes people just like each other and then they are in love and they get (laughs) married and it's fine. Can you tell the story from your book about I think you were at Sasquatch about eating the this is my favorite thing to say because it's so alliterated. The personal pan pepperoni pizza. Yeah. Um, people love this story because it's humiliating. Yeah. So I was at Sasquatch long before my journey to body positivity, by the way. So I was um, at Sasquatch, the Sasquatch Music Festival at the Gorge. So I was wandering around by myself, lonely, in the morning. Hadn't had your candy bar yet. I hadn't had my my <laughs> seven Twixes. Um, so I went to find some food. And music festival food is typically pretty terrible. So the options were like Domino's or like a tequila slushy. Uh-huh. So I was like, okay, well, I will have this delicious Domino's pepperoni personal pan pizza and a Pepsi. More alliteration. Yes. Yeah. And a diet Pepsi for whoever's listening, (laughs) because at that time, I definitely would only have a diet Pepsi so that people would know that I was very refined and small and delicate and on a diet. So um, basically what happened is I was in the uh, press area. I was sitting alone at a picnic table and I was eating my pizza and it was already kind of humiliating because especially then I was like, this is a much too disgusting food to be eating in public. Although no offense to Domino's, which I think is better than people think. I have a 16 year old and a 14 year old and they are not food snobs and they in fact only want to eat Domino's. And when you're a parent and you're busy and you like my husband, I do a lot of stuff at night. Like we go to events and we like have to work. And so (laughs) the other day, my Older daughter was like, sometimes I feel like the Domino's delivery people are my real parents. Oh. <laughs> Which was not a great thing That's to hear. That's really funny, though. <laughs> but it was really funny. Anyway, I'm just saying that I don't want to hurt Domino's feelings because actually I think I'm grateful to them for caring for my child. But um, so I was eating this pizza and then I had a napkin and then a gust of wind came and it blew the napkin onto the ground. And so then I leaned over to pick up the napkin and I was sitting at the end of the picnic table bench. And the picnic table was not like a hefty picnic table made of timber. It was like made of plastic and aluminum tubes, you know? It was one of those feather tables. Yeah. 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 It was feather light, obviously. And so then I leaned over to pick up the napkin and like shifted the center of gravity of the table. And then the table flipped over on top of me. So I fell on the ground and the table fell on me and the pizza fell like on my face. That's not true, but it fell in the dirt. Keep it for the story. Yeah. And um, the Pepsi did pour all over me. And so then I was just like lying on the ground covered in table and Pepsi. So sad. Um, And then I yelled, don't worry, because I saved it by yelling, it's okay because I'm really drunk Oh. Which I wasn't. It was 10 a.m. Yeah. And being drunk is better at 10 a.m. than being someone who's eating pizza at 10 yeah. a.m. Yeah. So nailed it. Did I... anyone lift the table off of you? No, I mean, I did. Oh. I just sort of rolled away. Stop, drop, and roll. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I put that, I wrote that story out in my book. And then I did an episode of This American Life. And Ira also asked me to tell that story. Uh, so I, I read the story on the show. Then This American Life has an incredibly rigorous fact checking process. So when they were putting the segment together, the fact checker emailed me and was like, can you verify that this happened? I remember seeing you put this on Facebook. (laughs) You do? Like, did anybody see this happen? Yeah. I can't believe you had to find a freaking witness. (laughs) So yeah, I had to go on Facebook and make a public post and be like, Hello. (laughs) Did anyone, was anyone at the Sasquatch Music Festival in 2010 in the press area and see a fat lady eating a pepperoni personal pan pizza from Domino's uh, tip over a picnic table and then yell that she was drunk and then roll away crying? Like within an hour, some chick was like, oh yeah, I saw that. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) Oh my god. And then god. I had to like put her in touch with a fact checker so she could like testify. All right, let's transition into a jollier topic. What would your last meal be? Oh my god. Okay, so don't be mad. It's like so long. <laughs> okay. All right, okay. I figured if it's my last meal and we course it out, 
I can take as long as I want. Sure. Like we're in Europe. Okay. Maybe Wolfgang will be the chef. Maybe he will. <laughs> or sorry, Wolfgang. Wolfie, my friend. So this was really hard for me um, to figure out because I love everything. And also because context has so much to do with yeah. what foods you love. And like, you know, when like you go backpacking and then you eat like instant oatmeal with a cut up hot dog in it. And you're it's like, the best this thing is ever. incredible. Yes, yes. And now I want to try that. <laughs> so I was thinking back to like the meals that changed me. So first course, <laughs> pancakes from Geraldine's in Columbia City. Oh, nice. Either buttermilk, sour cream or ricotta. So for people who don't know, Geraldine's Counter is a diner in South Seattle in the Columbia City neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And they have the best bacon because they get it from across the street from, what is it called, Bob's Meats? Uh Yep. It is so delicious. It's like very chewy without being too soft. It's the best bacon in town. It's like thick and special. So special. So um, yeah, buttermilk pancakes from Geraldine's. Uh, Can I just say something really fast? Yeah. Uh, Last week... My boyfriend said that his dad just started dating someone and he said, her name's really funny. You're going to think it's really funny. And the first thing I thought was, well, how funny could it be? How am I going to fake laugh for this name that's not really that funny? But her name is Marilyn Pancake. And I laughed and I was crying. I laughed so hard. It was true. It's such a funny name. And I want to know country of origin and where did this come from on Ellis Island where they like, you're a pancake now. I'm so jealous of that, to be honest. I love that name. Oh my God. Um... Okay. Second course. Second course, I'm going to put a childhood favorite. So my mother is, her her parents immigrated from Norway. They had seven kids. They had five kids in Norway, moved to Seattle, then had my mom, and then had my uncle. So she was the first of the seven born in the States. So I grew up in a very, like, Norwegian intensive lifestyle. (laughs) What does that entail? There's a lot of Norwegian flags around the house. My mom is very... She's hmm. <laughs> my mom believes that Norwegians do things the right way. Uh huh. Okay, I got it. Yeah. So anyway, one of the things that we always did was uh, once a month, all my aunties would we would get together and we would th- sit around and talk and bake cookies and gossip and I don't know whatever. That's awesome. Um, and we always someone always went, and this is a Danish bakery, Larsen's. Larsen's, but. Whatever. Um, someone would always go to Larson's and get a smurkake. Good which, pronunciation. Thank you. Before the recording, <laughs> we were Google translating it, and you did a really good job. Thank you. Uh, I think smur is butter and kaka is cake, I believe. Oh, God. I'm going to get in trouble. But, um, so is this a whole butter cake that okay, you get so, from Larson's? Okay. So you have not had this, no. right? No. Oh, my God. Okay. So, no. It's like a... So, it's a pastry, but it comes in a round aluminum tin, and it's... Like kind of like cinnamon rolls. So it's like little rolls of pastry placed into this tin. There's probably like one in the middle and then maybe five or six around it. And it's inside is just a sort of like a buttery, like almost a custardy filling. It's basically like the whole thing is on the verge of just melting into a pile of butter. Oh, with I got to try this. Just the smallest amount of flour holding it together. And then there are raisins in it. Okay. Um, is it kind of flaky? It's kind of flaky. Yeah. And but it's really gooey. It's like the best kind of like middle of the cinnamon roll gooey, except no cinnamon. Oh, it's so good. And oh, and, oh, and it, it has like an, a glaze on it, too. It has like an icing, just like a sort of, you know, a plain white. Okay. Like you would have on a cinnamon roll. Yeah. Um, Smurkaka. And uh, you can buy it at Larson's. So does this fall into the category of I'm going to use the pronunciation that my Danish friend told me, which is Hyge, the <laughs> H-Y-G-G-E, this word, which basically means being cozy and like getting together and eating tasty things and having a fire going and like enjoying each other's company and wearing sweaters. Is this what this monthly gathering was? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's exactly the vibe. You know, and now at this point, like people have moved away, a couple people have passed away and it's just obviously it doesn't happen anymore. And it was very much a cozy gathering of sweaters. It sounds really nice. <laughs> Higa, I think is the... Higa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, people in Northern Europe have a handle on how to survive the winter much I mean, better than we do here you in have Seattle. To. Yeah. You have to. Okay. So smorka, smorkage, it's spelled smorkage. S M O R K A G E. Why rent when you could have a smorkage? <laughs> you know? It's a good exactly. investment. We are only on course number two of Lindy West's magical six course journey, but we're going to take a break for two things. First of all, a word from our sponsor. Let's take a cocktail break. Uh, and when we come back, we're going to go to Larson's Bakery to learn more about Smurkake. I have to like stop and pause and do a weird voice every time. And we'll learn about the wonderful cozy world of Hyuge. Lindy West wants smirkake for her last meal, specifically from Larson's Bakery in Seattle's North Ballard neighborhood. And this is a neighborhood that used to be home to a lot of Scandinavian fishermen. So you could go to Ballard, you could get lutefisk very easily. uh, And so this Danish bakery fit right in. Larson's just celebrated its 44th anniversary. And I sat down with its original owner. My name is Paul Larson. I had Larson's Bakery in Ballard. How long has the bakery been open? We have been open since uh, March 10, 74. Wow. So you just had your anniversary. Yeah, 44 years. Mr. Larson, as his employees respectfully call him, so I will too, says he's the only baker in the entire country that bakes smurkake, which I found hard to believe because you can just find anything in the United States. Uh, but of course, I did a search online and I really could not find any other mention of any other U.S. bakery that is making this pastry. So I'm going to take his word for it. He says Smirkake is their second best-selling pastry after something called Kringle, and they bake about a thousand of them every month and ship a bunch of them across the U.S. So Smirkake, as we discussed with Lindy, is the Norwegian pronunciation. Mr. Larsen, being from Denmark, has a Danish pronunciation. Yet another word that is very difficult for the American mouth to pronounce in form. In Denmark, Denmark, we don't sing Smarke. Smarke. Smur. 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 Butter. I asked Mr. Larson about the history of the pastry. Notice I'm just going to keep calling it the pastry, so I don't have to keep <laughs> saying smirkaka and feeling weird that I'm saying it the incorrect way. I shouldn't have eaten because I'm supposed to talk to you, but um, do you know anything about the history of it? Um, I get, yeah, some, but we call it in Denmark Wienerbrot. Uh, they come to Kringler, they come to those, and to this. So, Mr. Larson actually doesn't know much about the history except for the fact that it originally came from Vienna. Smirkake is a laminated pastry, like a croissant or puff pastry, which means lots and lots and lots and lots of flaky, airy layers. So, the way that you do laminated pastry is you roll out the dough, you put a thick layer of butter on top, you fold the rest of the dough around it, and roll it out again. You let it rest, you put more butter, you do more rolling. It's just over and over again. And then, when you put this into the oven, All the moisture from that butter and from the dough causes steam to rise, and that puffs up the dough, creating these perfect flaky layers. According to an article about laminated dough that I found on thekitchen.com, this was by Christine Gallery, she says really good croissant dough will end up with 729 layers of dough separated by 728 layers of butter. Whoa. And, you know, it's not that big looking when it comes out, but it's just like millions of layers of pastry and butter. Amazing. So the smirkaka starts with a layer of laminated dough, and then on top of that is almond paste, raisins, and a custard. And then they take seven other pieces of laminated dough, spread them with the almond paste, the raisins, and the custard, and they roll them up into a snail shape, like a little cinnamon bun, and all seven of those are placed on top of the base. So it ends up looking like a pan of cinnamon rolls, and then after it's baked, it gets a layer of powdered sugar icing. And the result is a very flaky, custardy, tender pastry that that I found to be very sweet. Uh, So you really need the coffee to go with it to offset it. But like I mentioned, it's a tough pastry to find, even in Denmark. They're not that popular anymore in Denmark. Um, For many reasons, I don't know. Which is why I could find Uh, nothing about the history of this pastry online, at least not in English. Even the two Hyuge experts I interviewed are pretty unfamiliar with smirkake. They say they don't see it in bakeries anymore. They have never had it themselves. And that, my friends, is a great transition into the fact that we're going to talk about huga, another word I can destroy with my American accent. We'll be right back after this break. (laughs) 
Lindy West talked about these cozy gatherings of her childhood where her aunts would come over to the house and they would wear sweaters and gossip and eat pastries. And this is basically the definition of hygge. Something you've probably experienced in your life, but you just didn't know what it was called. It's a Norwegian word that has become a Danish phenomenon that has kind of recently invaded the United States in the form of books and articles. And one of the first books to come out on the topic is The Little Book of Hygge, written by Mike Viking, CEO of the Happiness Research Institute in Copenhagen, Denmark. What is hygge? The art of creating a nice atmosphere. Activities where we experience a sense of comfort, uh, perhaps a sense of togetherness, a sense of relaxation, and perhaps are enjoying the simple pleasures in life. It is about indulgence. It is about giving yourself a break from all the demands of healthy eating. Um, so hygge and the focus on hygge and, and the whole culture around hygge also explains why Danes, we consume, first of all, a lot of, of Danish pastries, or as we call them here, pastries. Uh, we also have the second highest consumption of sugar per capita or of sweets in, in Europe, only beaten by the Finns. So, you know, treats, cakes, coffee, all good uh, in terms of hygge. Um, basically, everything can just be a little bit more hygge if you add cake. Kind of like in England, how there's, you know, an afternoon tea and people will take the break and sit and, and have tea and cake and pastry and stuff. Is that something common that you do in Denmark? Is hygge kind of a, a planned thing? Is it a daily thing? It can be a planned, but it can also be a spontaneous thing. We talk about hygge a lot. So I'll invite you over for, let's say, smirke, let's go crazy. Hmm. And and before the event, uh, we'll talk about how hygge it's going to be. And then when we eat it, we'll talk about how hygge it is. And then when we meet next time, we'll talk about how hygge it was. <laughs> and so... Uh, <laughs> I love this word. So is this a conjugation of the word hygge, the hygge, just to, is that like the adjective of hygge? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's the adjective. So it can both be a noun, an adjective, but also a verb. Signa Johansson is a food anthropologist and author of How to Hygge, <laughs> The Nordic Secrets to a Happy Life. She was born in Norway and currently lives in the UK. Now, before a couple of years ago, I had never heard of Hygge before, but now there's kind of an explosion. When I go to the bookstore, I see all kinds of Hygge books on the shelves. I see articles, and Seattle was recently named the most Hygge city in America. Why do you think that this movement is happening? Why the uh, Hygge invasion on the United States? Well, I think it's almost like a perfect storm. I mean, for years, people have been interested in, in Scandinavian design, you know, contemporary furniture, art, You've had certainly in the UK, I don't know so much in the United States, but you've had an enormous interest in Nordic noir, which is a genre of kind of crime thrillers, both in literature and in television and film. But then there's also restaurants like Noma in Copenhagen. Like, so there's a lot of like top restaurants who've really come to the fore in the last decade. There's just a lot of interest in the region. I think also people are really intrigued and fascinated by the quality of life that they read about and they hear about from all the Nordic countries. You know, they, it's kind of embarrassing, but like at some stage every year, either Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark or Iceland seems to top a league table of, you know, world's happiest people. It's kind of a testament to the region as a whole that, you know, we don't have a lot of power. You know, we don't have political power in the world, but people live really well. And so I think that's quite compelling and it's interesting to people from outside the region. All right, guys, I hope you've gotten kind of hugely while you've been listening to the show. Are you wrapped in a blanket right now with seven cats on your lap, sipping chamomile tea and dreaming of bison stew? Well, good. That sounds cozy. I'm happy for you. I'm standing in a studio across from Aaron Mason wearing no blanket and I'm having no higgly. But I want to remind you that uh, this was about Lindy West's last meal and she had four more courses that you didn't hear about, guys. So we're going to go back to that, uh, to Lindy's six course meal, starting at course number three. Third course. Fool from Cafe Salam. Do you want to explain what Fool is? Yeah, so Fool is, so Cafe Salam is an Ethiopian restaurant in the Central District, uh, MLK and Cherry. And Fool is a breakfast dish that's like fava beans sort of mashed with tomatoes and onions and peppers and spices. And there's a hard boiled egg on it. And then you eat it with these beautiful little mini sort of fluffy baguette loaves. I don't know where they come from, but they're incredible. It's truly like the most perfect plate of food. I mean, I would eat it every day. Fourth course. <laughs> so I'm, like I said, this is an all day European 
meal. A smorgasbord. Yeah, a smorgage board, okay. <laughs> if you will. So fourth course, I was thinking of this as like a little sort of poo-poo platter. So we'll have bamboo shoots and hot oil from Seven Stars Pepper, which is That is cold... my favorite Chinese restaurant. Have you had the cold bamboo shoots and hot oil? No. Oh my God, it's so good. My husband and I are obsessed with it. Wow, I have to get this. So this is oh a God. Szechuan restaurant in Seattle's International District. And I go for the hand-shaved noodles. That is my reason for being there. And everything else comes second. Those are fantastic as well. So bamboo shoots and hot oil, green onion pancake from Szechuan Noodle Bowl, also in the ID, which is the greatest green onion pancake on earth. FYI. Okay. Spicy fresh salmon roll from Musashi's. So my husband is a really incredible cook, which is irritating because he's like really good at a bunch of things, which I hate. Yeah. (laughs) Like he's like a really good trumpet player. And also like when I met him, I met him through stand up comedy and I was like, that guy's so funny. Last year he decided that he was going to start building things. So now he just like makes beautiful furniture. I was like, okay, man, calm down. Ham just makes a really, it's very simple, but like really incredible teriyaki. So I would have a ham make me teriyaki. Is this still the same course? Is this still your poo-poo platter? Oh, no. Sorry. This is the course. This is the main. So we're at the main now. Okay. This is the fifth course. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) I was like, how many things can you shove on a poo-poo platter? Also, by the way, this is very, very ambitious because I know that I'm a fat lady, but like I I don't have that much capacity like volume wise. Yeah. Like I, I have to quit like definitely halfway through the pancakes. You know, (laughs) like. And then you have five other courses to go. I know. I know. know. Also, as a joke, but not as a joke, I was about to say sixth course, buttermilk pancakes from Geraldine's again. Oh, I like that. A nice book (laughs) ending. Yeah. It's like a palindrome meal. Yeah. So now dessert. Oh, my God. (laughs) Oh, so a thing to know about me is that all of these foods are fine. But really, the only thing I really like is sort of anything in the whipped cream family. I'm a very, and this is also kind of Norwegian, I think. I'm very like dairy oriented. So you're built to be a milkmaid. Yeah, I yeah. think I am. So one time I was in New York City, right? Like really at the beginning of my like my national writing career. This was my first time ever going to New York, like as a businesswoman. Like yes. I went for work, which was really exciting. So you were wearing shoulder pads. I was wearing like triple shoulder pads. Yes. Um, and at one of these meetings, uh, I had a piece of cake at a restaurant, and the cake was like, <laughs> it was like it was precision designed. To delight Lindy West. And I don't know how the chef knew that I was coming, but it was like paper thin crepe, layer of whipped cream, layer of crepe, layer of whipped cream, probably for like 50 layers. I don't know why, but I knew you were going to say something like that. I knew it. Look at you. Yeah. Oh my God. I think your essence is really strong and it's, <laughs> it's, it's soaked through me and now I know everything you like and want. When, he's, when my husband's making fun of me because I'm like wanting pudding or whatever, he, he calls me a milky baby. <laughs> <laughs> it's so gross. It's so gross. Um, okay, so so this was the ultimate milky baby treat. <laughs> That's their slogan and oh, tagline God, for this I, cake. I, I, it's so bad. It's such a bad thing to say. It's just layers of whipped cream and crepe. And, and it, it was like so good and special. And then when I went back to New York, I texted my friend and I was like, yo, let's go get that cake again. Where was that? Where did we have that meeting? And he was like, oh, that restaurant's gone. (gasps) And I was like, Do you think it existed in the first place? (laughs) I don't know. Was it really even there? Maybe it could have just been a hallucination. It might have been Um, a milky baby dream. (laughs) (laughs) And now I have roamed the earth dreaming of this cake. And that was Lindy West's last meal. Lindy West is speaking at Seattle's Benaroya Hall on Sunday, April 15th at 7.30. Get your tickets at seattlesymphony.org slash Benaroya Hall. Oh, and pick up her book. It's so good. It's on my shelf. You should have it on yours. It's called Shrill. Thanks to Paul Larson of Larson's Bakery. You can order all kinds of Danish pastries online if you want to try the smirkaka. You've heard it here. You can't get it anywhere else. Uh, so go to larsensbakery.com. That's Larson with an E. And thanks to our Hyuge Coalition for making me say Hyuge millions of times. Thanks to Signa Johansson, author of How to Hyuge, The Nordic Secrets to a Happy Life, and Mike Viking, whose name is not spelled like it sounds. It looks real cool and Danish. He wrote The Little Book of Hyuge. You should buy their books. 
This episode is produced by Aaron Mason and me. Theme music by Prom Queen. And you can find me on Twitter at I'm Rachel Bell, on Facebook at facebook.com backslash hello Rachel Bell. And please subscribe to the podcast and rate us on iTunes. We're James Beard Award nominated now. You're going to want to be a part of that. Hey now. Hey now. I'm Rachel Bell, and this is your last meal. Did I, was I saying Huga? It's, I think it's supposed to be Huga. What Huga? Are, Huga. Did I say it wrong the whole time? Yeah, I heard like a Huga. Huga. Okay. I think I, I meant to say Huga. So let's just issue a correction here. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't have to record the whole thing over. Hey, guys, I meant to say Huga. So don't get mad that I was pronouncing it wrong, even though that's probably wrong, too. I don't think there's a way to do it right. I mean, they fought over how to pronounce it, really, right? Well, once. Danish, one's Norwegian. This is how an American Jew says it. <laughs> Huga, and sometimes Huga. That's my edit for the whole piece. Nicely done. Thank you.